people himself, Delegate Michael Hornby. We have reached the bottom of the barrel, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Made it back from Charleston. Good morning. Hey, good to have you here, man. Good to see you, Tim. Is this our uh, first time, you and this me, is doing a, this together alone? I think the first time we did together alone was Home Show, right? And there was some awkward silence when I just ran out of questions. But, uh, yeah, this is the first time we've done the show. Right, yeah. yeah. First time doing it, uh, the show proper, so to speak. Yeah, well, I love it. Welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. It's great to have you here. And uh, we are joined via telephone by Delegate Gino Chiarelli as well, Republican out of the 78th. Good morning, Gino. Good to have you with us again. Good morning, friends. And you are never alone when you've got me. <laughs> Gino, how, what was your uh, what was your your uh, thoughts on interims? Which meetings did you enjoy? What was your takeaway? Um, well, I, I can tell you what, it was, uh, it was busy. You know, we can't all be away from Charleston for that long because when we inevitably come back, all of the meetings, all of the fundraisers, all of the events, they're all stacked on top of each other. So we were, uh, we were stretched pretty thin. I felt like it was pretty productive. I went to, um, I went to my gov board committee meeting on, uh, Sunday and then I went to my PEIA committee meeting on Monday and then I head home, I headed home Tuesday morning. Do you know, uh, before we get into some other stuff, uh, can you tell everybody what you do actually as a paying job other than being a delegate? Yeah, sure. So when I'm not in Charleston, I work for Mon Health. Uh, I am a community affairs liaison. So anywhere uh, where Mon Health or Vandalia is in the you know northern part of the state, I'm there. Uh, and I also figure out, try to find strategic ways to initiate uh, community contact, engage the people that live in the area, give them a reason to feel good about Mon Health. And do you also have experience in harm reduction? I don't have any experience with the, uh, like working for harm reduction programs per se. Mm -hmm. However, I've worked adjacent to harm reduction programs. I used to work at the methadone clinic here in Morgantown. I was a substance abuse counselor, and I also used to work for Child Protective Services, both in, here in West Virginia and in Southwest Pennsylvania. And how long did you do those jobs, Gino? So... Uh, working for Child Protective Services here in West Virginia in Marion County, Fairmont area. That was my first job out of college. I did, between that and working in Pennsylvania, I did child welfare for two years, and then I went on to do substance abuse counseling. I did that for about a year and a half before I ran for office. With that as the backdrop, can you tell me what you thought of Jeremiah Sample's presentation to the legislature in regards to drug use and abuse in West Virginia? Can you, can you state was, some of those I, stats, Rob? I can. Yeah. yeah, give me the stats. I was not there for that presentation. An estimated 208,000 people in West Virginia used illicit drugs in the last month, according to a survey by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Overall, the age-adjusted drug overdose death in the United States quadrupled from 2002 to 2022. West Virginia experienced 1,335 known overdose deaths in 2022, according to the Center's for disease control and prevention. From 99 until th 2022, West Virginia's overdose deaths increased 1,680%. West Virginia's overdose death rate is 151% higher than the best state in the country, 85.6% higher than the national average, and 36.4% higher than the next worst state. Of the 17,000 new births in West Virginia each year on average, 2,500 of those babies every year are exposed to drugs in the womb. Samples closed by saying it's a crisis. That's obviously the understatement of the year. No insult to Mr. Samples. Uh, but these are, these are, Delegate Michael Height categorized them as tragic uh, numbers, a tragic report. Your thoughts on these numbers, having had the experience that you've had in your background? Well, I can tell you, I, I wish I was surprised to hear a lot of this stuff, but it certainly tracks. I've known for a little bit about just how bad the addiction problem is here in West Virginia, and this is why it's one of the big things that I've been running on since the beginning, you know, since the beginning of my political career, and I'm going to continue to do so. These numbers are simply unsustainable. You know, there is this nationwide perception, especially if you look at polling data, where people are, are comfortable now saying, you know what, it feels like the opioid epidemic, we're on the tail end of it, we, we have things under control. That's just simply not the case here, and the numbers prove that it's, that it's worse than ever. 
we have got to do something about it, and we have got to do something about it now, because I know a lot of people bring their unique issues to Charleston, whether they're talking about economic development, whether they're talking about child care, whether they're talking about uh, workforce partic- you know, labor force participation rates. There is not one area in which people bring their issues to Charleston that is not directly or indirectly impacted by just how bad the epidemic here is. We have got to, we have got to do something about it. So, Gino, uh, this seems to me to be a societal uh, problem, and, and we down in Charleston can't really legislate m- morality. But after this report, how do we, how do we help? What, what's the? I mean, I know it's the six million dollar question, but what is the? What do we do? So obviously, we know that there are a lot of cultural problems that create a lot of the issues that we see. It's very hard to fix society sitting in a state legislator seat uh, in in West Virginia. We we both understand that. However, I can give you my perspective on things that I think would start to move us in the right direction. And I'll first start by saying that um, what you'll hear from a lot of our opponents, a lot of people that fall on the other side of the aisle from from me and Delegate Hornby here, is that, uh, at least with my opponents specifically, they want another study group. They want to sit down, look at the numbers, focus on how they can make themselves feel good in the answer. The results don't really matter. We can't afford to wait and sit around and do nothing while, you know, the, the society continues to crumble around us. So here's, here's what I'm thinking, okay? This, this is a two-pronged approach. What you need are increased health care, you know, increased uh, health care options, more access for pe- available for people that want to get better, and are going to try to get better, and you need increased criminal penalties for the bad actors and the people that don't, okay? We have to go at, we we have to hard go after the people that are bringing it here. We need to, we need to look, I don't believe in the death penalty personally, but we need to talk about serious first offense. If you're in West Virginia looking to deal fentanyl, you're going to prison for life. We can't, and these numbers back me up, I think, we can't afford to uh, go easy, on these people. We can't deal with people that are peddling poison in our communities with kid gloves on. We have got to look at extreme options because we are, we're, we're out of conventional methods. We, we can't afford to do that. West Virginia, we want people to know that we're open for business. We're not open to people coming in here and selling, selling drugs. We're just not. We can't be. Gina, take me through the mind of a substance use disorder situation. You've been a drug counselor. So Take us into the room there and tell me how those conversations go. Because obviously, the person who you're talking to is likely not in that room for the first time. Yeah, well, that's the thing, too. There are a lot of people that I've seen go through the program. They, they, attain, they, they go through it for a little bit. They drop out. They come back. People that show up to the, uh, show up to the methadone clinic, for example, where I worked at, um, they could be in any number. Of situations they a lot of people one of the common ones that I've heard is that I just had an overdose um, I was dead yesterday I have got to fix something now and that spark for a lot of people is what encourages them to actually look for uh, look for meaningful treatment they, they, they don't want to keep doing what they're doing a lot of people just come into the clinic when they're sick they think that you know they're going to be able to skirt by on a few few days of uh, low dose methadone get over the hump and then they're right back out on the street a couple of days later, and then they never come back. So it's tough dealing with addiction because there are so many variables. There is so much gray area. It is not a one-size-fits-all type, uh, type of treatment. But um, the, the most important thing about people that come into, the, come into a clinic like that, you find out um, what, their, what their living situation is like. You see what they're going through. You meet them where you're at, and then you come up with a program that works, that works best for them. But they have to put in the legwork. You know, they're the ones that ultimately have to get themselves better. And people that want to do it, believe it or not, they, they are capable of doing it. So, Gina, you know what my wife and I went through with, with our son and how, uh, how we struggled um, to find the help and ensure we, we basically had to have him committed involuntarily to start with just to get the drugs out of his system so he could start thinking normally like, Thank God we did get the help and he is doing well, but it took us all of nine to 11 months to get that help that we needed. Yeah, so, and this is another thing that I'm talking about here is that people shouldn't have to go through these obstacle courses in order to get themselves or their loved ones the treatment and help that they need. 
You know, when I worked at the methadone clinic, you have people driving close to two hours in order to get this, this methadone. And, and for those of you that don't understand how the methadone programs work, you have to show up every single day at the clinic in order to get your dose. You don't just get a standard prescription and then they send you on your way. You have to be at the clinic and take the, me- take the medication in front of a medical professional. All right, so for someone to drive two hours every single day to do that, how are they supposed to reclaim any semblance of normalcy in their life if they have to automatically throw in this four-hour commute in there? That is why we have to look at increasing the number of health care options. We have to make it easier for people to get, uh, to get the treatment. However, at the same time, as we've seen with our, uh, our friends in Parkersburg, is that we have to be very careful with predatory services looking only to collect Medicaid checks. Uh, they don't care about the end results. They don't care about the people. All they care about is the subsidies rolling in. So we have to find that balance. But I, at the end of the day, I do think that we need more um, more accessible options. So should those be a, a state-funded uh, option if, if for, for that, you know, to find I, that well, balance? Or do you, do you is it a mix of both? I, I think that, the as we know, the private market is very good at what it does, um, but if the number, you know, looking at the numbers from Jeremiah Sample's presentation, it, it's it's hard not to look at this as anything other than a uh, a real epidemic of proportions that we haven't seen before. I I think that if the state can do what it can to provide, if we can, uh, you know, make the right investments, if we can spend money in the places where it'll be the most effective. We're, we're all in this together. I, I think that West Virginia, we need to make investments, not only in things like infrastructure, but I think we have to make investments in our people. Healthcare at the end of the day, especially addiction recovery, I don't believe that it's a true free market. The end goal of uh, addiction recovery is not profit, it's people. So if, if we Good have point. to roll our sleeves up and, and spend a little bit of money to make sure that we can get our state back to where we need, I believe that we'll, we'll reap dividends in the long run. I think if we incur the short-term costs, We'll we'll see it we'll see it pan out a hundredfold in a decade or so. It seemed for for Crush and I and for for our son that the the only way it actually that we felt that it worked was was having him institutionalized at a state facility for thirty plus days where he you know he didn't have the choice to just walk out whenever he wanted to um, when he was jonesing for for whatever he needed. Um, so it and that was down in. I want to say Scott Heckert's uh, area had to, had to go all the way down there to, to do that. Uh, maybe an investment in some of those facilities, a private-public pri- private partnership to really try and address this issue is, could be an answer. Well, you know, yeah, this is, a, this is a messy topic, and a lot of these people need tough love. I am completely in favor of uh, opening up long-term mental health care facilities, addiction recovery facilities, get people in there, Get them into an environment where they're away from what they were, you know, what they were in before. Get them off the streets. Get them out of their, you know, their their friend's house, parents' house, whoever they're living with that is causing them, to, you know, that is continually enabling them to have this behavior. Get them out of there. Get them in a place where they're surrounded by healthcare professionals. Get them somewhere where they can only focus on themselves for a change, and then we'll worry about everything later. That that sometimes that's the uh, that change of environment, that change of scenery. Is the biggest is the biggest player. So I'm totally in favor of those those type of facilities. I don't think that they should be locked into what 45 days at the very maximum. Yeah, Delegate Gino Chiarelli, our guest here, a Republican out of the 78th uh, Delegate District. Uh, Gino with experience in drug counseling and uh, his uh, private uh, position uh, working for a living there. Gino, the startling information to me has uh, is, is obvious when you read those numbers. But the other part of this that we've not yet discussed, and this is the first time I've asked this question because we've done a week's worth of interviews on these numbers once they came out. Why West Virginia? When you look at the numbers, West Virginia, everybody's had problems, but nobody's had problems like West Virginia. Why? Well, I think that over the last, you know, so many decades or so, um, given our, our industry, our, our main industry, the decline of coal in, in West Virginia, the isolation caused by the geography, um, as people, as the, the industry dwindled down, people come out of it. Also, just the fact that the, the nature of the work is very laborious. People were doing a lot of high-intensity stuff. They're coming out with a lot of injuries. Prior to anybody being informed about what opiate addiction actually looked like, People would get pills hand over foot. They'd come out of the mines, uh, get their prescription, 
They would take these pills over and over and over. Their bodies would become chemically dependent on them, but nobody realized what would actually happen when they're no longer able to get a prescription. All of a sudden, they're getting these withdrawals that I'm told are sometimes worse than, than, than death. So in order to stop this, this withdrawal, they'll go out and they'll look to take care of that any, any way that they possibly can. That's the thing that a lot of people don't understand, too, is that a lot of people that suffer from addiction genuinely did not ask for it. It was through no fault of their own. They were stuck with this, with this life-changing and oftentimes debilitating disease, and they're just trying to pick up the pieces. Unfortunately, those kinds of patterns between economic decline and overprescription of uh, opiate medication, it has created these cycles that continue now through generations. So if children are raised in these homes where addiction is commonplace, more than likely or not, they're going to fall into it themselves at one point or, or another. Believe me, I saw it all the time when I was working for Child Protective Services. And because we've had these generations turn over so much, it's really, really ingrained in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of these families. So breaking those generational cycles is not going to eat, uh, be easy, but it's not going to be, it's going to be a lot harder next year, the year afterwards, if we don't try and do something about it now, if we don't dedicate a bunch of our time and resources in, in uh, handling the problem right now. I think part of the West Virginia First Foundation expenditures should be a thorough study of the conditions that made this level of abuse possible in West Virginia. What were the environmental factors that made West Virginia such an outlier in these stats? Because until we well, figure that out, Gino, I think we're just we're just spitting into the wind. That's that's also true. And me, me and um, Mike, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. But the thinking needs to be, how do we do more than just bandage the wound? We need to address the underlying cause. We can try and treat symptoms to the best of our ability all day. We can do whatever we can to stop the surface level stuff, um, stop the, the, the madness now. But how do we do the most meaningful change comes from uh, addressing the, uh, the underlying issues so that we don't end up in, the, in a situation like this ever, ever, ever again. So I think that while there's things that we need to do immediately right now, a lot of that is to save face. But I, I think you're right. Knowledge is power. And I think, uh, you know, good paying jobs is, is something that, uh, especially down in the South, there, 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 there isn't a lot of that to, to lift you out of that poverty level. So I think, you know, that's where the economic development comes in, where we're trying to bring businesses in that, that have manufacturing that can have really good paying jobs so you can pull yourself out of that, uh, that hole or you can pull your family out of that hole, correct? That's, that's exactly right. We need to, I think, uh, um, from, from our end, from the state's end, we need to hold our end of the bargain up and we need to create an environment in which people want to participate in. We need to give people reasons to say, I'm, I don't want to sit around anymore. I don't want my life to, to, to go like this. I don't want my children and grandchildren to end up the same, you know, the same way uh, as I did. I want to get myself better. I want to get the help that I need, get my family, get relatives, loved ones, friends, get them the help that they need. And then when we're, you know, when we're able to uh, return to normal, normal polite society, there has to be something waiting for them. We have to incentivize people um, because they could want, they could want to do it. But if there's nothing for them to, you know, if there's, if we don't give them help, give them a reason why, how, who knows how long, you know, we're looking at longevity problems. Now, back during session, I went down south and, and took a tour. And I know you went, what, about two weeks ago, you went down south and, and were touring mm -hmm. the, the south. One of the biggest the takeaways. South of West Virginia. You're the about. south, like the, the real the south. Southern, McDowell County. Yeah, Southern West Virginia County. Yes. Um, the big takeaway I had was the amount of trash and the way the communities looked. Um, it, it, I, I feel like. We, we could really make an impact if we just beautified the community so that we're proud to live in them. Your thoughts, Gino? So I went down there for a little bit more of a positive reason. I went down there to see what the, the CVVs in, in Mingo County were doing, look at the tourism industry in Gilbert and see what West Virginia has to offer like that. And I could tell you, I, I was blown away by, by the opportunity that is there, by the, how, how, it's, how unbelievably efficient um, and fiscally responsible that the the CVBs are, are are and what they were able to create from uh, from effectively nothing. They built this entire uh, mountainside resort and, and trail riding operation on top of reclaimed mine land. It is unbelievable what West Virginia has to offer in the southern part of the states. 
Um, and I think it, again, reinforces our, our entire conversation here, the need to re, uh, repair and restore the state, get us back to where we need to be, because believe it or not, West Virginia has a lot to offer. I've seen it. You've seen it. Um, and I, uh, I, I'm more than proud to be a part of, um, of the, the push to, to, to Especially to tourism, right? I mean, we, we have that opportunity. We, we've invested in tourism, and I think we're, we're really expanding our opportunities there. Yes, uh, Chelsea Ruby has done an unbelievable job um, in, with, with tourism in West Virginia. When I went down there, Gilbert was just, the place was packed wall to wall. So many people there from all over, riding on Hatfield and McCoy trails, touring local, uh, local restaurants and local bars. I got to see a bunch of them. It's, it's very, very encouraging to see, to see what's going on there, but we have to we have to continue to push. We can't get comfortable. We can't get complacent. Um, the hard work is still out of us. Gino, speaking of tourism, they are closing schools in Monongalia County tomorrow because of all the Pennsylvanians who will be flocking to Morgantown for the Penn State uh, West Virginia game. Your thoughts on schools being closed to accommodate the road traffic? You know, I, I think kids need to go to school, but I can tell you what, I hope, all I'll say is I hope these people from Pennsylvania come down. I hope they like traffic. That's all, <laughs> that's all I'll say. Because they're going if they're from Pennsylvania, which I am, they're, they'll be used to traffic. How far is your office from the stadium? Are you in that oh, general it's area? Close. It's close. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the mile ground up here in, in Pennsylvania or in, in Morgantown. I'm probably, I don't know, five and a half, six minutes. You know, I'm thinking about this. Pennsylvania probably is the only state West Virginians can drive in and think that their roads are better. Because Pennsylvania's most, roads most are likely. awful. I can, I, can, I can speak to that. I'm from Pittsburgh. I, yep. You're yeah. not wrong. Me too. PennDOT, baby. Just an excuse we to put them. out orange and white and, cones. And they're the only state that can charge you so much for the turnpike. I mean, it's like $115. You've got to take out financing to go on that turnpike now. What's up with that? <laughs> I, I, I made the mistake one time of taking the turn bike from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia when I was in high school. I couldn't eat for the entire trip. Because there's no uh, money left. How, how, much the, how much the toll was. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it'd be one thing if you were driving on a nice road. But you're not. It, it would be. But, alas, yeah. you know. You got the Jersey walls on both sides of you. Point. Hey, Gino, thanks. We appreciate you being on the program here this morning. You got 30 seconds. Uh, any final thoughts, sir? Um. Thanks for having me, as always. Call me, text me anytime. Um, for the most part, vote Republican. We need it. And thanks for coming in a lot. Last minute, Gino, five minutes before the show. I really appreciate that. Thanks for stepping up. Anything for you, Dad. <laughs> oh, there's got to be a story there. <laughs> Gino Chiarelli, and we appreciate him from the House of Delegates.